Have you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? And can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers will take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? My name is Joanne Helfrick, and I channel Rose. My name is Paul Helfrick, and I've been studying the channeling phenomenon for decades. All right then. Well, uh, let's let's for both of you then. Let's go back to the way back for you both. So, was anything in your past? Was there any signs of any abilities for either of you? Did anyone in the families have any abilities? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I've always been a creative, sensitive person, uh, but when I look back on what I was doing as a child, it was just doing things like that. I was unaware of any, anything like this until I was much older. And for me, absolutely not. I was raised in a secular humanist family. So rationality and non-religion uh, dominated. So I was not familiar with anything until I was 21 and came across a book called Seth Speaks. And that had to do with channeling. That was my introduction to the channeling phenomenon. 21? At age 21, yes long time ago right no that's just interesting that you would you would uh, at that age choose to come across that material that is a significant number in esoteric systems yeah mm. okay and was there any books that yourself Joanna <laughs> came across I came across Seth Speaks when I was in my late 20s and I just happened to find it in an airport bookstore at the Philadelphia airport. I was called out to go to the Midwest. My father was dying and I wanted something to read that helped me be connected in this sacred space. And um, so I found it in this little tiny airport, airport bookstore. And then some years later when we started dating, um, I think it was on our third or so date, Paul confessed to me that he had read all these Seth books and loved the material, and I think he was half afraid to because he didn't know where I was coming from. And I said, oh, yeah, I read Seth Speaks, and I thought it was fantastic. And that sort of put us on the path to being okay with each other's um, interest in, in the Seth material specifically. Um, um, and what did you get out of that? out of my experience in talking to him well, or the Seth information, I always really loved Jane and I admired her quite a bit and I never really thought that I could do that. So I really have revered her for a long time. She'd probably hate my saying that. But um, yeah, I just felt like I, I, it was everything that I had been thinking and intuiting put into terms that anyone could really understand if they were to open the book. And I felt a sense of trust about who I was, so I didn't really need to read a lot. I just wanted to sort of live it and have it become a part of me. Whereas Paul's path was really deeply into the scholarship of the Seth material. 
Well, just one other thing. We're talking origin stories here, like the X-Men or whatever, Spider-Man. That book, Seth Speaks, when I got it from my brother, uh, coming home from college break, I had an epiphany in the first hour reading it outside. I remember coming back into the kitchen and thinking, this is the most significant thing I've read in a long time. Something, it struck a chord deep inside and being age 21, I was mature enough to receive that, resonate at that, with that message. And it just got me all excited and I started studying anything that I could get from Jane Roberts at that point. What, what about the subject of channeling as, as, a, as a way of bringing this information forth for you both? Did that, uh, was that difficult for you to accept? Initially, yes. I was so skeptical. I remember in the beginning of the book, Seth Speaks says, I am a discarnate personality, yet how can I be writing this book? I'm rolling my eyes thinking, well, obviously you wrote the book, you know, kind of a thing. But then the first chapter, an hour into this thing, something went click. It's like, oh my God, this is valid. There's something valid about this. I had never been exposed to anything like it. So I was titillated and intellectually curious and spiritually curious. And that just opened that door and the rest is history. We've never shut it. No, and for yourself? You know, I didn't even consider doing this as as deeply as we have since, obviously. Uh, Now that I'm a channeler, Um, I was in the corporate world for a lot of years, so I didn't really have time to even think about this, you know, until some years later, and we had been supporting channelers for a while. We came out to California um, to, you know, we we ran conferences and things like that for the Seth Information, Elias and the Chris uh, Chronicles. And we, you know, I, I, I always admired these people who were, some of them were my friends who channeled, but it, I never thought that I was ever going to be able to do it, honestly, until, you know, something happened that, that turned me to begin thinking that I could. Okay, well, what happened? So what happened was we had been investigating this information for a while and reading a lot of great things, the the Seth information and all the other ones I mentioned, Elias and Chris, plus depth psychology, uh, other spiritual um, people, and you know just really immersing ourselves in the wisdom traditions. But what I think we both noticed is that people had a hard time knowing what to do with the information. So it was a lot of theory in a lot of ways and people you know, had a hard time knowing how to put it into a place where they could really bring value, where they could do things that they love, where they could find the connection with it and really make it practical for themselves. And so we went to a conference where I asked a lot of people in the integral world, in the Ken Wilber world, um, where are the instruments for finding out what our calling and our passions are? And they didn't have one. And I knew from reading Seth and Elias and Chris and other sources that this idea of families of consciousness could help people connect with their calling and their passions and express that. And so I came back from this, we came back from this conference and I said to Paul, You know, I really want to be able to divine these for people. I really want to help people because they're just walking around kind of disoriented to their own passions. So um, I sat down at a Ouija board (laughs) and I never been able to be that great at a Ouija board before. And I sat down there with that lifeless planchette for an hour a day for about 10 days just to get um, this this information for people and do readings. And I had put colored dots on the Ouija board and I got some of those colored dots after a few days and then I got I got letters and then I got words and then I got sentences and then before I knew it, I was autotyping at a typewriter and then voice channeling just in a matter of a few, a few weeks. And I think it was that deep need to help people connect with their passion that really is what did it it was that need to serve and to um, help people in a way that I thought I could so all the years of having the material there to sort of um, 
help you, guide you into the path that you are on now. That was all there to serve you to get to that point. Exactly. Yeah, now that I look back on it, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Paul, um, obviously uh, your career went... If you just tell us a bit about your career and up, up to the point leading to when uh, Joanna started to channel and what that was like for you. It's tough, but in a nutshell, I did my graduate work in music and that led me to uh, a job at a science museum doing a science of music exhibit. 10 years went by there. So I have this music background, I have this science background. And we met, we went to a Seth conference in Elmira in 1997. And there we met Mary Ennis who channels Elias, which seemed to me at the time, geez, that's 20 years ago, this, yeah, over 20 years ago now, uh, to be a continuation of the Seth material, which was a, a huge thing because Jane had passed in 1984. I remember thinking, okay, that's it. We're all alone for the rest of our lives with this lineage, so to speak. And that led, we moved out to California and led to a period of 15 years of studying, channeling, esoteric, bodies of knowledge, the world's religions, psychology, Ken Wilber's integral psychology, it was very important for us both and just having a, a larger framework within which to plug all of these unknowns into and situate them without denying their validity. So music, science, spirit. And then uh, that led me to an integral certificate studying at Ken Wilber's first graduate level program offering in 2000 and five-ish, six-ish, somewhere in there, 2006, 2007. And I was getting ready to do my thesis paper for that integral psychology program. I was going to do it on education because my intent is a educator's intent. And this one starts auto-typing and I'm hearing from the other room, this is happening and, and this whole thing unfolded. And it's like, okay, universe, I hear you. It is time for me to apply Ken's integral map to the channeling phenomenon and, and do an outline of a pilot program, which I did in that thesis, of how to do a scientific study that covers all the integral bases in Ken's system. And it's a whole other story, but it just shows that scientific approach. How can we kind of just briefly put in there about Ken as well, just so we've got some background on it? Sure. Ken Wilber is a preeminent social philosopher, psychologist. Uh, he is not well known in the academy because the academy has its own challenges in terms of psychology and schools of psychology. He's always been a maverick and a rogue and on the outside and integrated East and West. So it was very much a Western academy. He's bringing Eastern ideas and developed it on his own and with, with other support, but he developed an integral psychology that as I studied it, I saw, oh my goodness, I had this epiphany in Cambria. We were up the coast here in California on vacation. I'm reading his book, Integral Psychology, and rather than detailing the map, the map that I saw is, oh my goodness, this can explain the channeling phenomenon at, in 20 different ways where some of these personalities are coming from at the level of development or wherever in the spiritual realms, trying to map the spiritual realms has been an impossible thing forever anyway. And trying to make sense of all of that, Ken's integral psychology offers a roadmap to at least situate these things and ground them yes. in a rational way and look at them that way. Mm. So it appealed to me greatly and I believe it's the best theory of consciousness available. As a psychologist, you're looking for the best map, the, the most accurate map, roadmap, as you're exploring what Seth called the unknown reality. And so this, that's just my plug for Ken's work. Um, there's a lot of answers to come for decades and centuries even, I believe, in that. Thank you so much. Now, now um, Joanne's going to be channeling just the, the latter part of this, um, but let's just stick on this, this roadmap right now that we're on, because this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> so you've been able to interview Rose, the entity that comes through Joanna? I wouldn't call it interviewing. I engage her. I interact with her. I dance the dance of the puzzling wonders with her, yeah. 
What has that done for you deep down, do you think? If, you know, just to have my wife start to channel uh, was a surprise. It was not expected. Um, and yet, to, how to be supportive and help her go through this transition period. In a way, it's like coming out of the closet with your own identity, your own self-identity shifts when you become a channeler. Suddenly, there's another or others that are coming through, other energies you have to wrestle with and buffer and, and relate to that are non-physical, and you have to get all of that within the physical world too. So as we joked amongst ourselves, there was no marriage manual for us in our 40s and 50s of now there's a third person in our bedroom with us anytime <laughs> and anywhere wow. else anytime. The most intimate possible places, this other personality is available. And how do you relate to that in a healthy, hygienic, constructive transformative way it's a challenge it's not easy we've had our ups and downs for sure yeah you know you don't think of that from the from the couple's perspective doing this right. type of type of work right yeah yeah we've had to really manage it and um, you know the other thing too is that when you start something like this as a channeler you want to share it with everybody and even when that person really isn't ready or open for it so I've really become more reserved and less likely to offer things when they're not asked for you know sometimes too so you really want to help people and you want to fix things but you learn to just sort of withhold that and wait until you're asked and that also of course has made me more open to filtering open to filtering through my own intuition and my own sense of helpfulness so it's helped me compartmentalize Rose in a way, but also incorporate Rose. Sure. Just right, so that I'm more Rose than I now than I was when I started 10 years ago. So, yeah, I, he and married I me. I get regular Rose <laughs> reports. I mean, I was talking to Rose in the shower, and this is what happened. And as I woke up and was processing a dream, Rose, I was talking to Rose about it, and this is what she said. And was, oh, well, I had a dream. Do you want Rose to come through? Okay, you know, let's, okay. You know, or today I'm not quite, no, I don't want to go there. Or today, okay, let's go there and see what, what that will offer you know so it's an incredible experience i think that's so honest of you to share this as well because i've met so many couples on this road sharing this work together and it's you know one's good at the business one's you know not so good so they the, normally the channeler uh, you know not 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 so good but it's you know it, yeah they need the couple energy there to support the whole thing yeah. right um i've met couples that hold hands that allow one holds hands, they, they hold hands and they allow the energy to come through for the other. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's the guy that's channeling and the woman that's doing the business. Sometimes the woman that's doing the business is the guy that's channeling. Um, and I'm starting to meet couples now who both channel. And I would say Paul does channel, and it's what John Klimo, who's an expert at channeling, would call open channeling, um, because he is a composer. He writes music. He writes. It's really the musical you know, impulse. There's, and, and some of my research writing, when I get into state, uh, I just call it wider Paul. It's, I look at it afterwards and go, that's brilliant. Who wrote that? I, that's, that's smarter <laughs> than me. I'm not that smart. That is really clever. Or is it you're, with channeling, you're bringing the bigger aspect of yourself in, and you were that smart. It's just in this human body, it's narrowed down just a slight bit. That's a perfect way to say it. One image that I have is this galaxy trying to squeeze itself through a straw. A funnel. And only straw. a little bit of a straw, like an immense galaxy just coming into this room through a little straw. And so, yeah, and so the straw has to widen to, you know, how far it can wide without dissipating and deconstructing, dying, killing itself is part of this whole thing, too. How much energy can we handle yeah. in these bodies and with this system? And it's, it's more and more as we go along, we think, but we don't know. Uh, okay, then for both of you, what is channeling to you nowadays? I go back to Rose's definition of channeling, which is it's something everyone can do, and uh, she defines it as 
the innate, our innate ability to accurately translate inner experience into outer experience in ways that are aligned with our intent in life. So it's a matter of being able to go deep and really deep and then expressing that creatively in, in whatever way our souls were designed to do that. You know, and there's infinite number of ways that any one person can do that, um, and so that's what we're talking about. It's just you know something that we sometimes have a hard time finding, and she was really taking the mystique out of it, which I think is really necessary. So I really, really align with with her definition. The way I define channeling is from a spiritual scientific perspective. I see it as its own multiple intelligence, as part of multiple intelligence theory, that it's an innate part of us. For example, the multiple intelligence, linguistic, language, language arts, mathematical, musical, emotional, moral, interpersonal, intrapersonal. These are all intelligences that have been identified in research in the last century. And it was a no brainer to think, well, there's a creativity line or intelligence and channeling is its own system within the larger personality system that can be immature or more mature and develop. Right now in our cultural evolution, it seems to have atrophied and be waiting. It, there are certain examples like Edgar Casey and others from the past who are startling examples of something very unusual and not, not normal, paranormal uh, in our experience. But so it's something that we all have. It's something innate. And of course, this requires more research to tease out and put in a in its own box. Everything ends up in a box from a researcher standpoint anyway, but to help us understand it better and then to help develop it better down the road, to look at it in a, as a stage model of itself from seedling to sapling to tree that, and, and educate, to educate people like Dr. Xavier of the X-Men is educating the mutants. It's the same metaphor socially of this innate ability that's really in the closet. It's really atrophied. It's not socially acceptable. And the other idea of us being multi-persons, not just being Paul or Joanne, that it's Joe Rose, you know, or Seth Jane, or, and Jane called it aspects aspect psychology and that there's different as sub personality in ken's system sub personalities that we can bring through or not bring through that they're tied to to anyway without getting too technical about it no that's a great analogy hang on there that's a great analogy because when i've been channeling you know i'll say oh it's an, as an aspect of casey that's coming through mm -hmm. oh it's an aspect of this it's not the full integrated thing that we think it is no and seth called it a bridge persona or bridge personality and this is a nice construct that it's a temporary thing that happens in state so this is a state-based intelligence perhaps and that's something that has to be measured and proven by going through waking, dreaming, deep dreaming, the, the major states that we know about. So what can come through in those different states? You're very grounded with all this, very grounded. And that's what's so nice to see right now. And I think that comes from your educational background. And I think that's why we were pulled together to get you on here from that perspective as well, just for, for yourself. Um, I feel as well, just got to say this as well, there's something dying to come through you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can so yeah. feel that they are just itching to come through. Hey, just, okay. just bring them back just a little bit. Just uh -huh. the, Whoever's there, just, just wait just a few minutes, right? Okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, but I can feel that energy so badly. <laughs> All right. um, um, you're both very aligned to me with the Seth material. It, it's very strong in you right now. Let, let's just bring that Seth material back up in, into the forefront of this interview just a little bit. What was so special for you both for the Seth material? What, what's so special right now rather than what was special before? What's so special right now with the Seth material still? As I researched it and read it, as I researched it and read and studied it, it seemed to be an incredibly true, more true, less partial, as we'd say, integrally, more true, less partial, of least distortion of a revealed body of work, of explaining ontology, the multidimensional self, epistemology, Seth presented inner senses to complement outer senses, how we know what we know, what's true, and evidence of the true, uh, 
just seem to be very accurate and clean, uh, less religious, uh, emotional, feeling driven, and more rational driven in describing the spiritual world, which defies description. Now that was Seth's truth, wasn't it? That was part of his intent to, I believe, pre just pre present a new revealed body of work to help pave the way for the coming decades and centuries of evolutionary change of the social system that's now at seven and a half billion people and growing. Um, but was that Seth's truth? Whose truth is that book? Or book, body of work? I would say it's Seth Jane's truth. It's a hybrid. I mean, Jane, we can't take Jane's ego and personality out of the equation as a filter. So that has to be accounted for. But every prophet, all of them, back to the Gospels, their egoic personality to some degree colored the revelatory material that was coming through them. Oh, God, that's just so true. You look at every prophet and they were, cha they were a channeler. Of some kind. Yeah of some kind and that's right they're colored so so every channel that's out there in this documentary that i've come across they they would say that there may be only 10 percent in the way you put them under regression and speak to the oversource or their higher self and they would say no actually there's 77 percent in the way or something like mm -hmm. that they just think they're 10 percent only left out, out of the way so so how much do we feel to this material all of us we do. And then not just take whatever gets to come through it, hopefully least distortion, low distortion, then I have to interpret it from my stage of development where I'm at. And if I'm lucky enough to have an altered state of some kind, I come back into my normal physical state and I have to interpret that experience based on my overall stage of development. This is Ken Wilber's great contribution. So there's all these different interpretations and really, and I don't want to get too big of a picture, but it's really a tower of Babel out there developmentally and what's happening and to try and explain all of these things to try and fit it in a box of just here's the three or four things and ways of interpreting this um, there's a lot of confusion and, and room for distortion and misinformation and misunderstanding as information comes through and is given too so I mean and you don't put an eight-year-old uh, in the space shuttle and say, go ahead, drive this thing up into space and bring it back. You train them. Well, absolutely. But then, you know, all the channels that I've met, it's just the truth at which the entity is at that that's coming through. They've each got a different truth. Yes. And the belief systems of the channel are filter those, the language, the linguistic intelligence, mathematical intelligence, emotional intelligence, all of those things are coloring what comes through as well. And they know this. We're all in concert together. That's so true, but what about the ones who, okay, so yes, so some entities seem to come through those who have got the innate ability to have a bit more science background or mathematical background or whatever background it may be. Maybe they've done it in past lives and they're just bringing back, they're able to bring past life aspects of them through that helps that which is trying to come through. And here's the thing with Jane and Seth. Seth said Jane did not have a strong scientific background, so this was a strength for him and a reason for using her from his perspective. Her rational self, her cognitive development was very high. She was brilliant. So that brilliance came through in all of the published work, but she wasn't overly biased by a preconceived scientific enterprise. So when and as channelers coming on this documentary are bringing through great scientific information, yet they have no background in science, that could be a reason why. Absolutely. Yeah, to get it in a new way, a different way to think about it, to come up with that new innovation. You know, how do we get energy to these houses without wires, you know, wireless? How do we pull it out like Tesla, pull it out of the atmosphere, all of the power that we need? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, but but those channels who only bring oneness through, or bring a more a, 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 the law of attraction like Esther Hicks, it's mainly based on that. Is that again filtered by the individual wanting just to bring that information through, and the and that which is coming through, and say, well, okay, we work, we'll work with you. I think it's impossible to say in any blanket way. You really need to look at each individual, look at their background, their biography their upbringing, their belief systems, and, and take it from there, and, and that'll help. And their intent. 
So these essences that come through, these energies that come through, have basic intent. And this does align with the consciousness, these pools of consciousness that I was describing. And so they have certain ways of things to get across that are aligned with this overarching intent. And so, so do the channelers, they have intent too. So for example, Seth, as we understand, was of Sumari intent. And they are the artistic pot stirrers. And it's hard to describe any one of these families in specific terms, because everybody's a little bit different and we don't want to shoehorn people into any one thing. But Seth was Sumari aligned and Elias, who is another great channeled uh, energy, is Sumafi aligned. They are the teachers and they want to get things across least in terms of least distortion. So their channelers aligned with them. And so what you have is a product that's driven by this intent idea and what colors everything really that we that we do. But not may perhaps none more so than when we're talking about, you know, channeling in words and um, but you could have uh, an energy that comes through the body, the physical body, the Zuli family comes through and those persons channel that Zuli intent through great works of, of as ballet dancers or feats of strength or the through, you know, Olympic Games or any number of, of things. And then let's not forget as well that, that uh, Seth was channeling Seth too from a higher level as well. So maybe it wasn't even Seth that was bringing through all this, some of this great information. He right. was channeling it from some other level, bringing it to Jane. And that's another interesting part of that body of work, that it just shows there are different realms, different spiritual beings that are at different evolutionary points in their journeys as well. And it's not just the angelic or soul realm, that there are, there are multiple realms. What about the rest of the body of work of channelers out there right now? Because Jane's gone. Well, she's not gone, but she's not in this timeline right now. The work continues, but the work continues of new channelers coming through with new work. Absolutely. Why does it... If, if Seth was that which work was so fantastic, which it was, why do others keep coming through? And I think Joanne nailed it when she said, if we look at that typology of the nine families of consciousness, that there's nine different intents. So there's constant variation. And it's a systemic look at nine different intentions to create a, a robust civilization and a robust drama of civilizations. So there's a whole thing that Seth called source events, master events that happen in the spiritual world that are circling us that precipitate into physical probabilities and so these nine family intents just color those things so it could be the entities coming through people now i'm just using that word it's not the nicest of word but it's just the, my human word for it now i'm sure it's not entities it's it's, it's souls it's 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 god coming through it's it's our sources of aspects of, of the creator coming through d d d disguising itself as something else right so to give us options right so that we know ourselves but these things that come through <laughs> um well they're coming through, aren't they? And it's almost like they're all on their own individual journey. When I, when I asked, asked one channel, oh, do you know this channel? Or do you know that source? They were like, no, we're just in our own little region. Well, and here's the beauty of it. So when you have, for example, a Seth, a Sumari intent, with an Elias of Sumafi intent, whose information bears similarity in a lot of really wonderful ways, then you have the ability to view that information in ways that doesn't make one more right than the other. You have the ability to, to look at it from the filter of their intent, teaching versus pot stirring art, artistry, like Seth did, and then you, can, you have a basis for comparing them differently, but then they complement each other, ultimately, as we all well, do. That's almost like we're channeling another world out there, and it's like different countries we're channeling, and they've each got their different view on their own truth, but they're all from the same place the same world it's all the same source that ultimately yes it's like different ha fingers of your hand isn't it you're just speaking yeah. to they see it differently and it's a different way of connecting yeah yeah well, well but, but then this this wholeness this this individualness uh, and it's obviously infinitive 
maybe the individualness out there is all trying to know itself ultimately yeah. why would it want to improve us for so that we could be happier you know when we improve ourselves we are better people Typically, is that what your question was? Where, why what are they trying to make is? us <laughs> better? Let, well, um, you know, why are they trying to improve us? That was your question, and I would say because we're we're happier when we're aligned with that loving energy and we're compassionate for ourselves and other people. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So they offer, they offer, they offer, and it's there that they open a door, but you've got to step through yourself. So it's part of the will forces being developed in, in the individual personalities with this kind of information that comes through. Is it an example of what a loving person would do if, if, if they see someone they could help? Actually, a, lo a more oneness person, a more loving person would go out and reach out? Absolutely. Are they the example of where we could get to with oneness? I'd like to think so, absolutely. I mean, you know, God is love. Seth talked about this concept of value fulfillment, which is driving everything, everything in balance to everything else that its best abilities can be developed together more cooperatively, less competitively. But we need competition as well. Mm. In, in all the years of researching this and doing this, what is this? Can you still even answer what this is, this reality in a sense, in your own truth? The model I use is Jane. She talked about idea construction, that this is a constructed universe. So we have the Hindu concept of Maya, which unfortunately gets distorted translation into illusion, illusory. It's a construction. The idea construction, it, trans, it goes back to the German idealist philosophers who knew idea, mind, consciousness is primary, the physical worlds are constructed. They're not primary, they're temporary, but they are incredible and there's value fulfillment in experiencing them in what we learn here. It's a learning environment. Yes, we're here to learn. We're here to 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 uh, to grow from our past and, and and maybe even our future, which affects the life that we've chosen right now, this present moment. We're here to to to. I don't even know if I even, even believe in karma anymore, but we're here to grow. I'll go with that. But then, why would we want to make a world so perfect if the soul is so desperate for the contrast of everything that's different here? As in the pain, it loves the pain. As in the drama, it adores the drama because it gives us an experience. Why are we trying to make the perfect world? That's a, a f impossible. I mean, the, the idea of perfection really is the Godhead, the one, and to return to that in perfection. That's all that I've gleaned thus far. So everything else is the journey towards that. And we, as the Buddhists say, we can choose to suffer or not by our grasping and our aversion, what we hold on to, what we fear is the root of suffering. And to learn to handle those forces brings a greater equanimity and a greater sense of happiness and joy. Well, I think of Elias's um, take on it, which he says that we're here for experience. And he sort of shies, not shies, nothing shy about Elias, but he, he moves away from the learning part of it and really is about experience. And I, and I compare it to, you know, I was raised a Catholic and I think of God and I think of whatever this oneness is as being all-knowing, but this oneness wouldn't be all-knowing if this oneness didn't have our eyes and ears to experience and learn from, you know. So that oneness is learning from us and our experiences. So God, if you believe in some kind of God, you know that it has experience. And that's what we're part of, that experience. That's interesting. So what you're saying there is what I agree with as well, but that's okay, <laughs> is that, you know, when we when we speak to Rose in a minute, yeah, we are learning Rose is as much addicted to us as we are uh, not that's a well, we are. We, we do get addicted to this stuff mm -hmm. sometimes, don't we? You know, she is as much in wanting from us as we are wanting from her. Yeah, exactly. It's not a one-way. It's a two-way. It is transfer. It is. Yeah. And we miss that part a lot of us, don't we? 
they're growing from us and we're growing from them. So what aspect are they really of us? Are they a future aspect? Are they an aspect that as we grow, they grow? That's one way of looking at it. One way I conceptualize it is it's nested. It's, and Ken uses the ter term holons, holes made of parts. So you have the whole, the one, and then all of the parts, the one within the many, and all of those parts, it's like a fractal, it's like a hologram, have wholeness and pieces of wholeness, macro, micro, as above, so below, all of that interpenetrated. Yes, yes, yes. And even when those that say they're channeling source, God, m maybe it's just an aspect of God they're channeling. Yeah. Source. And, you know, I, I also come back to Elias, too, who said, you know, there's very few truths with a capital T. He defines truth with a capital T as are things that are consistent throughout all of creation. And there aren't that many things, you know, everything else is sort of an interpretation and certainly our beliefs. And, and, and it's not to pish posh truths. That's not what I'm doing. But he really comes back to as a Sumafi teacher who's interested in least distortion that the real truths with a capital T are that, you know, source is love. Love is a truth with a capital L. Color, according to Elias, is a truth. Tone is a truth. So, you know, energy is a truth. So when we come back to those things, then we can see this magnificent creation that we have created here, all of us. And, you know, using the many intents that we have, too, I, I think that, at least in our physical reality, intent is there. Maybe all of them, I don't remember. You would remember that, but... Well, okay, then. How has this worked? I kind of asked this before, but how are you approaching life nowadays, guys, with, with the body of work that you know and, and the body of work from Rose as well? When something sets you off, how well do you do? Because we've done so many practices, it's the idea of personal practice, which anyone on a spiritual path develops over time. And I call it my bag of tricks. Um, what, you know, techniques and devices, you know, mantra meditation, witnessing meditation, blah, 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 times a hundred. Um, there's so many things to pick from nowadays. But you come down to your core set of practices, and those are what carry you through the dark days. Because, you know, when you realize whatever makes you brings you back into the loving light. However you conceptualize that, the oneness, the wholeness, those practices are the ones to do. So that's really where we go. At some point you leave the books on the bookshelf or in the computer or on the hard drive, and you have to go out and face the day and interrelate. It's about relationship with others and how those relationships, the ups and downs of relationship with others and all the different things uh, that come from that. That's so true, and for you, Joanna? Oh, ditto. Um, really well said, you know. Um, I have books, you know, and I, and I found that after it, the last presidential election that uh, one more person spouting wisdom wasn't really needed. And so I thought, well, I'm, if I keep doing that, perhaps I'm in a bubble. So I got out and started working in my neighborhood because I was finding myself just that we were isolated here and we have neighbors around us and what are they doing and what about their welfare? So I became more cognizant of being in the world and then, you know, the practices, oh, that's so true. It all comes back to the practices for me. You know, isn't it amazing, you know, just on Twitter yesterday, and this will be old news soon, you know, Trump was talking about, you know, I've got a bigger nuclear button than you yes. and, and my mine works. And it's like, you know, we can't change the world. We can change ourselves, though. Right. And isn't this what this body of work also does? Mm -hmm. It does. And one of the things that recently came up was I had a dream that I was the Trump whisperer. I was a Trump whisperer. And he was open to being educated better, listening to better music, taking care of himself better, eating better foods. And I woke up and I said, all right, who's with me? Who wants to be a Trump whisperer? And yeah, okay, we can change him. And what that does, though, is point out where I am, where I am like Trump. 
and where you know I need to look at my own shadow self and ways that I'm not having compassion for these parts of myself that I've disowned and so that shadow work is so so important and uh, and and probably fundamental to everything else isn't that so true that life is a mirror yeah he's mirroring to all of us something that we've got inside of us that we are that way otherwise he wouldn't be there would he that's right right and also learning how to take on people who really are bullies you know but doing it compassionately rose calls it policing and love it's like i'm going to stop you my older brother perhaps i don't have one but there's a bully in many houses that really needs policing and love and needs to be stopped from from being a bully and if we can get it at that level perhaps we won't have them as our ceos and our heads of state you know, to really every day to not tolerate bullying and know how to how to do that. He really has done some great things, hasn't he, Trump? I mean, you know, what a great mirror, you know, for for, for the abuse towards women as well, yeah. um, and everything else. I mean, you know, it really just you can't get away from it, can you? Do you know what I mean? Uh, so so it, now must be a special time. Oh, it is. In a way, it's a regression socially. Uh, and sometimes you'd have to regress before you can stabilize and push forward to something new to come out. We all know, you know, we've been hearing this for decades now. Some big change is happening. We're in the middle of something. We know that. And systemically, it's a regression in a way, but giving us time to look at some of those elements, understand them better, because we need that foundation. It's like a ladder. If you have bad rungs on the bottom, you can't get to the top of that ladder. Yes, absolutely. And it's, you know, a lot of some of the channels, not everyone, but some are saying that this is only the beginning of the change. You've not seen nothing. Yes, yeah, this, is, this is what our sources from various sources, you know, like strap yourselves in for the ride here, the coming decades. And this was a reason why I became a Waldorf teacher. I gave up on the adults, just kidding, not really, but I realized the children are our future. And if I can plant these seeds, just basic reality creation concepts of a healthy, well-balanced, fully integrated, free-thinking individual personality to face that future in a healthy way, that's where we need good education. Thank you for that. Okay, so just, uh, the, yeah, this is great stuff, guys. To just moving this on as well, just a little bit. Um, would, what would you say are the reasons for there being more and more channels coming into the world right now? I, more freedom to come out of the closet, so to speak. I mean, look at the gay lesbian community in particular and the freedom they're experiencing now it's still controversial it's still difficult uh this has been with us forever you know which witches were burned at the stake people have been practicing things on their own forever and it, it's been with us i don't see it that it's that different it's just now that if it's encouraged and that strangeness uh is more acceptable that difference is more acceptable and again the utility of the information is important too now all, we've agreed that all prophets were channelers, right? So now we see again addictions to channeling as well, addictions to certain uh, uh, channelers out there, right? That they're so uh, protective of that channelers, you know, you, you it's, it's, it gets into that mind space again of, of, of religion in some respects. Not that none of the channelers can help that because that you know they're doing what their what their heart, their purpose tells them to do. Uh, but you know, but you know, it's almost like people say you could even call Eckhart Tolle a channeler, right? And people will say, "God, how many times have you been to an Eckhart Tolle event?" Oh, I've been five. How many times have you been ten? Do you know what I mean? And the same for the channelers. So, so why do well, how how do we get there? Why, what what do we do? What do we what are we doing this for? I believe that. Um it is time that we are all learning to connect with our own sense of the divine because we've been taught otherwise we've been taught that there are middlemen to god and this is highly inaccurate in fact it's created a lot of bad stuff in the world um, with in religion uh, and in some ways in gurus you know there's a lot of gurus who are just not good people and they and i'm not talking about the your channelers necessarily but i just mean people who start communes and things like that who have this sort of i'm the one in charge and you just you know follow me and um and now what the channelers are saying at least the ones i'm familiar with are saying look we all have that 
direct connection. We all have that inner authority. And so we're all learning to take back our inner authority and to act from the divine. So it's been a lot of years, you know, that we've been in the dark and now we're at this wonderful time. So there's, starting to emerge. there's a leader follower model, which is you need that you, you raised as a child. They're the adults, they're leaders, you're following them. But the authentic lineages teach you to think for yourself and not to follow in. There's a Basho quote that says, don't follow in the footsteps of old men. Instead, seek what they sought. And any good teacher is going to say, you don't want to be doing what I'm doing. You have your own destiny here to fulfill individually. And I'm giving you some tools. I'm leading a horse to water. I can't make you drink, but I'm going to make that water so delicious and so transformative that if you are lucky, you may just be on a ride beyond your wildest imagination. With channelers, they're very much um, about the soul's progression. They're not really about giving validations about someone that's crossed over. Now, some will do this, right? But do you see that there's there's potentially going to be a, a, a change in the way that even future mediums give readings, where it's more of a, a soul reading that's uh, when some of this validation stuff is a bit a bit more diluted in a sense where we're not hinging on to the validation yes but also this is the trend since the 60s and the jane roberts is really a, a delineation sociologically speaking here with channeling before that from the 1830s or 40s to 1930s was the spiritualist time and mediumship was the crystal ball and talking to the dead and so the channelers of that period were really talking to a very human realm with jane and others now these deeper wider more highly evolved spiritual beings are coming through and i want to mention something that blew my mind when i found it in my research the buddhists have a tradition that they call mind treasure they have a channeling tradition in fact the dalai lama consults an official state oracle who is a trans channel they call it mind treasure or terma or gonter. They have their different words for it. But just the ubiquity of this throughout human experience is, is an important thing to remember. That's so fascinating. Um, okay. Well, just guys, just thank you so, so much. Is there any last message you both might both like to give at all? Less is more. Keep it simple. It's, it's all about love at the end of the day. Love rules. I second that. Thank you both so very, very much. Thank you. down do you just do you just not go down that's the wrong word but go through go in how does that is that like that is in? not really this is more of an effortful thing than you might want to do as a channeler she needs to be invocating rose in a very big way and this is about mostly grounding mostly also meditation in specifically in resting in rows. Now, this is a very important practice that we recommend for everyone because rows is the essence self that's very wide, that's very big compassionately, as well as in, is very attached into the realm of other essences. So when you tune into Rose, you can tune into almost everybody who ever lived in a sense. So what does that take to tune into Rose? It's more of an effort for her than most channelers. So 
She just does what you do when you say, I'm going to be creative now and you get into the self that you are without caring much about what you're saying, doing, etc. The thing is you get out of your own way. So Rose is that self in you as well that's there for you when you want to get out of your own way. Now that's also something to consider. The self that you are is also essence self. You're connecting with your own essence self when you do anything wonderful as well as anything that's sometimes misfortunate. Your essence self is always there to assist you. Rose helps you connect with your essence self. So to just summarize, the continual Rose self that you have now is also there for you when you need her and she is there to help you understand things that your own essence may not even understand. So this is a big place we're in and you're allowing yourselves to explore this place in excellent ways, in beautiful ways, in compassionate ways and Rose is there to help you anytime you need us to. Indeed. So this is a very long-winded response to your wonderful question and that is she goes very deep and she needs to sometimes put in more effort than she really would like to sometimes to do that. Indeed. How much percentage-wise is Joanna out of the way for Rose right now? She is in this about 80% now. We are not saying this is more than most channeling sources though. This is about par for any channeled uh, source to be about 20 in. And that's a good channeler in our view. Not to say there's anything wrong with being a not as qualified channeler. However, this does take practice and it does take support from others and all sorts of things to be in this field. So 20% is a reasonable percentage to expect as well as a very remarkable one when you consider this different sort of energy transference indeed thank you you're very welcome excellent so rose who are you we are a vast multiple essence that's very much a part of this physical reality that's very much a part of many realities we are vast because we are connected into many different sorts of reality creations as well as proclivities for understanding that need to be incorporated into your physical reality sometimes. This is not to say there's any reason to believe the path for you is anything but perfectly suited for you. However, sometimes you need some support from the divine world which is not any more divine than your world. This is just because you sometimes forget how very divine your world is. So we are here to assure you about that as well as 
to assure you about your own divinity, dear ones. Indeed, we are there for you, and you're there for us too, because we love you, we revel in you constantly. Whether or not you even know this, we do. Indeed. What is your karmic connection to Joanna? <laughs> That's a very good question because you're intuiting something very deep in this connection. We have a sense about the Christ drama that's very connecting the dots for you as well as her. She has an intimate connection with a focus of attention in the Christ era that she's very drawn to saying things about. This is more or less a complete book or works to come out at another time investigating this chapter focus. However, there are many chapters to this focus that you have now, as well as many others together. Many have to do with the Christ drama that's being told in chapters now. We think you have a genius way of going about seeing this new era into the fruition that it needs. You help it along. You are human. You're helping things. That's what humans do. The connection, therefore, with Joanna, who is a woman in the Bible, who is there to witness the Christ drama firsthand, has to do with Rose, and she has the ability to get the information about Christ back then, what was going on, as well as what's needing to be told now in your lives. This is part of the connection too, of course, with all of you. What will be told about this phenomenon that's very needed in the sense of what the Christ drama did for your world 2,000 years ago. This shift in consciousness that's occurring now is very much about what's going to happen now with this energy that's Christ, really. It's about the Christ consciousness coming back, in a sense, the Christ Consciousness has always been here, of course, however, the many reasons for pushing it aside are great, and there's not any reason to believe what's happened recently is wrong. This is about exploring consciousness in ways that are beautiful. This is about redeeming the teachings in ways that are helpful for individuals, helpful again. So we're going to be coming to that space in the coming years, and that's how we roll. We help others connect with their Christ consciousness, you might say, their calling, their passions, etc., their service to the world. This is something that needs to be done in your world by you all. and. There's many of us that are helping now, and we will, of course, indeed. So when we speak about Christ consciousness, Christ, in a sense to me, just my own truth, just reached the idea of oneness. That's yes. Oneness in the sense of oneness with your reality around you, not the oneness that's sometimes feeling removed the Atman, for example, the Christ consciousness that's sometimes feeling unreachable. We want you to be in your bodies. We want you to enjoy your lives. We want you to express 
the things inside you, even if they don't seem very saintly sometimes. This is about turning into Christ in ways that allow the whole self to thrive, not just some inspired teaching that says you need to be better, etc. There's reason to be better. There's, of course, reason to be better people sometimes. The joke is, cosmically speaking, sometimes that you're fine exactly where you are. This is a balance. This is a very yin and yang kind of teaching. However, the Christ consciousness is in you, and it's always been there, indeed. The bells are ringing in celebration of that, that idea, that it's here, it's imminent, this is always going to be, and this is always going to be there for you, indeed. So, really, in what people may turn as, term as unethical jobs, no matter what we're doing, we can find oneness in all our works, and we don't need to start wearing white robes, abstain from sex, and take valves of whatever we may have done in the past. <laughs> That's right. Chastity, poverty, etc. These all f are all fine paths to expression. These are not to be condemned at all. However, you're in charge of your lives now in ways that the path will reveal. This is not about giving up. This is more about embracing who you are as well as the world around you. We want you to have sexual contact. This is a beautiful thing, as well as necessary thing. We want you to enjoy a martini from time to time, a roll in the hay, a sunset. These are all beautiful things. We want you to be a good person too, because in this enjoyment, this allowance, this appreciation for the world around you, you need to also connect with others, with people, the animals, the trees, etc. This is not a solo affair. This is about opening up past your ego self, allowing the ego self to enjoy itself without worrying too much about how it's doing or, or what it is and isn't in control of so that it can allow things to happen. Like Joanne here is allowing this to happen because she's able to get her ego out of the way enough to let Rose come through and everyone has the ability to do that. It's just not something that you're really taught that often. However, in doing so, you gain an appreciation of the world around you as well. This is something of a reciprocity that occurs as you begin the process, inner as well as outer work indeed. So are you a group or, uh, I, yeah? Oh, very millions of us are involved with this energy exchange, yes. And are you communicating with others on this planet? Oh, yes. We communicate with the essence selves that have focuses in this reality, as well as other realities. So we do not have physical focuses. Rose, that is, does not have physical focuses. This is not considered by us to be a physical focus. Like she has an essence that's connected to many other focuses, of course. The soul, the essence self, has focuses of awareness in multiple places. The physical world that you enjoy, the non-physical worlds, many other life lives in other places. We don't have those. We allow ourselves to connect with your essences to have these focuses of attention. So we do the connecting, you might say, 
the connecting the dots together to bring you your essence selves to help you enjoy yourselves more for example to connect with your essence selves to do that indeed so this is a very big energy you're speaking with however we are very small too we are here to support you there's no reason to feel that we're ever the ones who know better than you see so this is a very important aspect of our teachings too that we're here to serve you not the other way around so much that's what we do we're essence we help you we're angels most of the time there are some darker energies to your point that are here to make sure you are discerning indeed you know that's a very important aspect to your reality now discernment but what do we discern do we discern the human being or the message well both the medium is the message indeed right so we're here to connect the dots let's say between human as well as essence selves indeed we have many ways to do that the channeling phenomenon is very much about finding ways to connect the dots when you're born you aren't born with every single line of development ready to go you learn things and sometimes you find out that the things you're not good at are not things you're necessarily interested in either right so you get more from not finding out about what you're good at than finding out about what you're good at so you can say I'm going to pursue this area now because I'm not good at math. I'm going to enjoy myself in the arts, for example, then find ways to connect with your own sort of channeling. This is about not being great at everything. This is about enjoying yourselves, whatever it is. So this is a very human thing to realize there's no reason to feel that you need to be supermen and women. Clark Kent never turned in a newspaper article. After all, did you ever see him turn in a newspaper article? No, he was always being Superman in his own way. Maybe he wasn't great at writing articles. Our point being is that the Superman is a myth and not everyone's good at everything. So the things that you enjoy are things to pursue and the things that you don't enjoy typically are, are not things to pursue. Although sometimes you do need to get teachers and education move you into areas where you can use things, different disciplines, for example, to help you be who you are. Otherwise, you can just realize selfhood in your creative acts really it's very much about creativity as a means to connect the dots between humans and essence of course you're all essence so even the language breaks down when you want it to indeed interesting um what keeps you doing this we rose love you we love your style we love your grace we love your essences we love your foibles we love your seeming mistakes we love you so very much that we can't ever feel differently ever 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 do we ever feel differently about you we love you now as well as when you're in your deepest darkest moments we love you why is that we are essence okay we have a depth to us that's born from humanity 
that's experienced, that we can call upon when we need it. We also have the ability to connect deeply with Source in ways that you can't all the time. So we are in love all the time, which is really a misnomer as well because we are timeless, dear ones. So we are there. We are there for you in this state of love that you can tap into and we can help you do that. Are you the same group that comes through everyone and calls itself a different name or are you separate in your understanding? That's an excellent question. In regard to the group, it's not exactly one group that's doing this. However, there's a reason to believe this group has a very deep connection with Rose. We don't have the same identity as this group. We are Rose. We connect with a Roseness, which has to do also with intent. Our intent is to connect the dots with regard to humanity as well as divinity. In this, we teach, we are a Sumafi teacher most interested in least distortion, we also connect deeply with our intent of Borlidim, which are the nurturers who are orchestrating this shift in consciousness that's in process now. So the Borlidim, the nurturers, are facil facilitating this organizing that's going on. This is organized in every way, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes. This is all happening because we are helping you, as are many others in our realms. Indeed, this is not just Rose, of course. This is everybody who's ever been connected with you is part of the shift in consciousness that's happening now, indeed. But we are you. Yes. You are us. Yes. Yes. And we chose to have this experience for you to have this experience? And you, <laughs> which of course is you. We try to use the language you have to explain this. However, this is very tricky because you're describing yourself as human when in reality you're also essence, right? So you are essence and we know what you mean. However, this is part of the issue in that people don't know exactly who to identify with when they say you or I, right? So this is about you with a capital Y now and you're allowing more you with a capital Y-ness into your physical reality now. And this is about you as essence self doing this. Are you aware of the others that I've spoken to? Yes, we have reasons to say good work too, for they're all wonderful, wonderful teachers indeed, in every way, indeed. But if we're here to get back to oneness, or that's a process that we're trying to move towards, how can anybody in any religion move towards oneness when there's only a set truth? Yes, we're saying there's not any one set truth to go towards. There's reason to be in the world because you're there now. We don't suggest there's any truth to go towards except to be loving yourselves as well as others. That's the only thing that you are really learning to move towards in our view, where you have not tried to go, you're trying to go now. And in this, 
the purpose for essence is to help you do exactly that. This is to help you go to where you want to be, not necessarily to move things along into any certain direction. You will evolve. There's reason to consider this evolutionary path as a given, a given towards your own emergence. This is about emergence, not necessarily attainment towards anything in particular. Emergence, flowering, let's say. Thank you. You're very welcome. There are many religious sources that sometimes impose on in ways that don't really reflect our views about the situation involving giving things up. We don't want you to give things up anymore. We do, if you need to, to support others, etc. However, there's too much giving up, too much scarcity sometimes. We want you to enjoy your lives in abundance and enjoy the world around you. This is a beautiful place and you will find ways to make this more beautiful if you can get your heads around that. There's beauty, however, there's also emerging beauty that's happening now. So perhaps this is helpful to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like doing this documentary. I just feel like there's me in the room sometimes and there's no one else. Yet there is because there's people in the room with me. But where does the separation stop or begin if I'm speaking to myself through you? That's an excellent view of how this occurs and you speak to yourselves in the way others have of speaking to you too. This is all true, let's say. This is all true and this is also a paradox, right? So if you're truly being a channeler, you're going to open to everything. This is about opening to everything, then seeing what comes out sometimes, being discerning about what you're hearing, then saying to, I'm going to express this through my intent. So you, you're learning what this intent is now, so you can truly find ways to get the information you need, foremost from the many energies around you, as well as in you, and let go of your need to do the expressing any particular way. In this, you're going to find out more about your reality as well as ways for you to ha have fun doing what you do. This is about your intent. So this is about learning to tune into your own essence foremost, not just anybody, your own essence, Rose can help, then tuning this back into the world through your intent, which is what we help with, to help narrow the field while opening things up in you in how to express this beautiful information inside you. So, Indeed. So this is only my truth as the person that's making this documentary. Well, there's not any one truth to anything much in our experience. Yes, you're going to channel this information into the world in your way. This is going to be very truthful for you. This is also going to be very truthful for many others. However, we want to get you to veer a little bit away from truth because this is a very big topic and you in not claiming to have the truth will be in the truthy part of it. Indeed, the truth is in each individual who comes across this. 
Okay, so by me doing this documentary and asking these questions, these are questions of my own truth, and by me sharing this truth to other people, then I'm sharing my truth, and that is the highest form that I can do. Yes. Yes. Share your truth. Share what's true for you. What's true for others, too, will be coming through you because you're both doing the channeling this to others work. Hence your questions about how to put it forth. You're also learning to let go of a big truth with a capital T beyond what's really true. Tone, love, etc. These are beautiful things. The truth of love, for example, is about the best thing you can have as a truth because this is central to everything you're doing now as well as everything that's coming up roses in the next phase indeed. This is about love as a truth as well as the many sorts of truths that you're accepting too even now is this true the president of the united states is not a good person is that true not really he's a good person in his own way is he somebody who would be considered a good person though by most people not really so this gets very tricky when you consider the multiple perspectives that you're now dealing with from an ego-centric perspective President Trump may not be a good person in our perspective yes he's very good he's doing exactly what he needs to do in the world as a reformer primarily this is an intent the bold intent is very much wanting to shake things up right now he's doing a very excellent job at it this is from our perspective though, not from the individual's perspectives who are cast out of their apartments because he's not able to provide services to his constituents. So he's not a very good person. He's also a very good person in our view, see. So this is about essence self, ego self, and how to bridge these these ideas even in ways that are helpful you know you said something interesting um, at the beginning as well and I can't remember the exact words you used but it was almost like a thank you to me for, yes. for this um, you know I don't think me, meeting the people that I've met recently and realizing that there's a transformation even in the, 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 the ways that psychics work I don't know if I could work with psychics who aren't willing to go deeper with their, with their information or, or at least look at things from a different perspective anymore. Well, we will say these are very good for some people who need to allow themselves to believe that there's life after death, for example, or there's an energy connection between individuals that's psychic. This is very good for where they're at, which is at a stage. Now, we're going to talk about stages a bit here. These are very important things, stages of development. The allowing, the allowance for psychics is very much about an order of understanding that's wonderful and is also necessary to your own growth. You need to have people into psychics to get to where you want to expose them to the channeled sources, for example. So this is another stage of development that people are at, ready for, some of them. And this is about having a very beautiful cornucopia of different sorts of beautiful expressions of essence, indeed. So this is okay. This is about your choices on where you want to go with regard to how to 
potentiate the psychics if you'd like to or to not potentiate them. We can help with that. However, this is something that you need to do for yourself, this discernment indeed. No, I feel that 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 you know the psychics are really important in all this because the, um, I mean, m some people aren't going to get you, are they? Nor should they. Nor should they, because they're going to be who they are without Rose, and this is not about them getting Rose. This is about them getting themselves as essence. Is. It, the divine authority in each of you, you might say. Is there an evolution, though, to the psychic's work? Yes, indeed. They will continue to evolve in many ways without any help from others because that's what they're doing, right? They're channeling their own essences on the most part. Then they're using that information to be better channelers as well as to learn from these teachings. Sometimes, not always, do they learn from the teachings. So they are doing their work, they're evolving too, and we can help you find out where these may go in the future. However, that's correct. There are many reasons to feel good about this whole thing realizing the next phases in ways that are greater than they've been before in terms of teachings, abilities, etc. Yes. I can't seem to get down to the bottom or can never get to a, a happy truth of exactly what this is except for it's like an onion and you're peeling back the layers, but it's like an infinitive, or it's like a grain of sand on the beach. Do you know what you are? Yes, we do. Have you always been aware of what you are? Yes, because we've always been. Have you always been this wise? Yes, because we've always been. Yes, because you're creating a difference between you and us. We're you, we learn from you, we are you in the world, you might say. So we're there with you. So yes, to answer your question, we're wise because you're wise, because you're wise, because you're wise, etc. Infinity, infinity because you're all there together. We are all here together now. But that would imply that this is almost like some sort of game, like some holographic universe, but it's not, I'm using the wrong words here. It's almost like it's not real, but it is. Yes, because you're allowing this to be real for our purposes as well as your purposes. This is about the state you're in. Now, we are another state of being, you might say. This is about connecting with the oneness in state, not necessarily stages. So we're here in state. You can always tune into us as well as your essence in state of oneness. So sometimes you confuse the states with your stages which is what the dear weary boy here is schooled at, diffusing this in a sense into the different ways to view the phenomenon, which is either as a stage or a state of being. We want to assure you both are beautifully appropriate for this phenomenon. You do evolve into new selves. You do become more essence-like, while at the same time you are essence, yes, so this is a difficulty of language, as well as you're already that in state, in the state of eternal oneness with us as a hologram which 
has holo in the word meaning one. So there's a oneness that's in you that's not artificial. It's not dividing of ego and essence. This is all connected together. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I grew up, I kind of became more aware. I, I remembered my days more. And I was more aware than I am. I, I think there was a point where I was completely unaware. So, I have no recollection of where I came from. It feels like it was blackness, but there was consciousness in that blackness. But I can't say for sure, and I'm always like many other people, like, shit, did I actually come from somewhere, or have, yes. have I been here, have I done this before? Yes, multiple times in some cases, yes, indeed. This kind of scenario? Yes, many, many more scenarios like this than you might imagine too, yes. In this type of time period? In this type of time period, as well as many that have a resonance with this time period, yes. So if we say I've had deja vu before, I could say that actually we've all been in this room before, and we've done it differently. Yes, in every way, when you especially consider that you have potentials that have been unexplored in this reality. We consider this a very big teaching, so we don't want to astound you into feeling connected only to your darkness. However, there's also probable selves that you're tuning into past, present, as well as future probable selves. There's a many splendid way to look at this whole thing. We come back to, you're always connected with us. We're always connected with you. You have love for you always, whether or not you think about it this way or not. The consciousness you sense is real. This is another truth that you need to really think about because consciousness is a truth and you can hang your hat on that physically speaking, literally speaking, because we will tell you again as well as again that consciousness is primary to your physical reality. This is what propels you into new spaces. This is what makes the grass grow. This is all consciousness. So this is the unified field theory of everything. So when you go into your remembrance of consciousness in the dark space, realize that's a beautiful reflection of your own understanding of what this is all about because there's always going to be consciousness in the darkness as well. Not just light, not just white robed figures of light. This is all about the darkness too, dear one. Absolutely, and this, even in the darkness there's light. Exactly. There's light in the darkness because darkness teaches. Yes. And it's all part of what is. Yes, indeed. Not to reject it. Am I helping to create you in this moment to yes. make you up? Yes, indeed. This is about your ability to connect with your own essence self, we help you do that, indeed. So we're here for you to dream about, too, for example. Yes. So I'm creating this conversation as with the free will that I think I've got right now. I'm asking, and I'm helping you to create more of yourself. Yes. Had I not come in this room and done this interview, would you have been aware of that truth? We would have known about your true, your true self and the ability for you to potentiate that true self in whatever form you want to take. So if you were going to take, for example, the potential to not show up today, we would have helped you 
with whatever it was you needed at the time. We did want you to come here today because that's our intent to help you do your intent. But that's, uh, yeah, that's in this timeline though, isn't it? We are not in your timeline, really. We interject things into your timeline. We're eternal. We don't have time in our reality, really. So we're here always for you, and we mean that. Always. Could I go back to this moment in a life review? Yes, indeed. Could I change it? Yes, you can alternately choose other potentials for yourself too. You can go out the door and have a cheeseburger after this or not. You can go wherever you'd like to after this session as well as before this session. So this is all happening at the same time for us. We view your potentials, then we try to get to you in ways that are helpful to you. So, so that, we have been involved so far, yes. That would say that the idea that us humans think of a life review is not what we think it is. Right. This is more about how you move into the next dimension as non-physical beings. You review in the way of sp spirit in our terms. You review how close you got to your way of spirit, you might say. Then you might do some healing work to move you into new areas of expression. You might enjoy some potentials where you did or did not get that cheeseburger, or get that partner, or get that reality. You have a very many reality creations to choose from at any given time. However, we will try to move you into areas where you'll feel better and have the best potentials for expression as well as fulfillment. Absolutely. So, so I want to use that example as a life review there just to show what we think we know. Like we bring all the same information through our books, don't we? Like this is a life review, this is what happens. But actually in this moment now we're saying actually there's something much more even just to the life review. And this is an example of how much more there is to things that even we thought we knew. The sand crystal goes on forever. The sand crystal has dimensions inside it that go on forever. Now we don't want you to feel overwhelmed. However, we do want you to realize this is forever now. We're talking about not your physical dimension so much. This is not in the same way, okay? This is not in the same way forever. This is more transitory. This is more unique in the sense that there's many many ways to experience reality. So this is finite in ways that we're not, let's say. And this is not to say this is finite, it's not. It's just having its own set of rules that curtail some actions in ways that you want for your own existence for your own expressions as well as for your own experiences well thank you very much for 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 that um do say what's on your mind dear one you can edit it out later no no i i don't i mean on this journey for such a long time now, i'm not too sure what's up or down or left or right really that's okay because you have your steady cam in front of you that really sorts things out doesn't it for you right you have the orientation that's all you need. Orientation. We will say this about orientation, okay? This has to do with your intent, why you came here, as well as the present situation that you find yourself in, being comfortable with this, breathing, 
realizing your essence, allowing us to help you, as well as having the sort of moral compass that you need to be in the world, because this is something that Rose talks about that's needing to be told in your reality. You have moral intuition. What others lack, sometimes you can choose to bring with regard to what to do in the moment in ways that you're not getting a lot of teachings about these days, except the teachings of religion. So part of our agenda is to reinforce what's good about religion, which is to do good things in the world. This is very important. There's reason to orient yourself towards goodness and love and being good to people and of service to people. This is the intuition that lives in you always unless there's something that happens that moves you out of it. So the level of information that's been brought out so far in most of the books that exist in this timeline, uh, it, w w when one picks up those books, that's probably the level that that person's at most times, unless they're just even just browsing through it. Maybe they've just wanted to catch up on something on it. I don't know, whatever. They, they may have read it a thousand times or whatever, right? But it's ne mainly the level that the person's at. So when we're discussing some of the things that we've discussed right now, this is this to show people to break away from the paradigm that's out there and come up with newer truths, that, that you can come up with newer truths? Yes, indeed. The reason to feel good too about what you're presenting them is that individuals will bring their beliefs to the works to translate them according to their own stages too. So they will find value without needing to really get into Rose, for example. They will translate her according to their own beliefs. They will translate the religious aspects they see into religious aspects in their understanding of spirituality. So there's reason for individuals to, for example, be religious about these teachings. They're there now and they need to go onward sometimes if they're not having a good life if they're not really educating themselves about what they can do to be emerging, let's say. So if you feel differently about the Seth material at the end of your reading it than you did before you started, that's exactly where you need to be. And that's what the teachings are for, really, is our own evolution as well, our evolution, we'll say, so as to avoid this linguistic challenge of us, essence versus you. We're emerging too, always. But you're coming through to tell us your truth. Yet I'm giving you and saying to you, oh, what about this? What, what about, is, this, is there a truth beyond this? You know, like when I've mentioned what I've mentioned here now, and then you agree with it and you say, yes, there is a truth beyond this. And yes, that is a reality. But you will never give us that, that reality unless it's asked for, or unless we're, we're the ones coming up with it to tell you, is this true? That's exactly right. We won't push anything on anyone to feel, see, learn, etc. This is your construction in every way. You, meaning yourself, ego self, as well as you as essence self, as well as you as rose self. So this is a very complicated way to say, yes, there's truths as well as many different ways to view these truths, ultimately. So the truth we come back to is the truth of love, mostly. This is guiding you always. This is underneath the explorations that you're taking on with regard to the truth, that ultimately 
truth with a capital T, consistent across all of reality, is love, is tone, is color. However, there are many real things that are truthy, with a small t, you might say, that are also real, that are real to you that may not be truthful as well. So this is a big topic. However, we will say too, dear one, that you're correct to go forth looking for truth. You're correct to enable others to speak their truth. In this, you will be more truthful in every single way because this is going to be about the truth of self. With a capital S, if you want to put a small s with that, that's fine too, because the truth of self includes all of this. All of this. What is self? Is it you as ego? Yes. Is it you as rose? Yes. Is it you as essence? Yes. This is the truth of self. It's very wide, indeed. It's also very including of your physical reality. Selfhood is what you're getting to find out about, truth-wise, indeed. Does that help you, dear one? You're doing a wonderful job, according to us, according to your own essences that are around you all the time, supporting you in your beautiful efforts to find out how to heal the world in beautiful new ways. You're doing the work. We want you to feel every day that you're doing a wonderful job at following your intent as well as following your inner light indeed. And finally, what, thank you by the way, thanks for that. <laughs> You're um, welcome. What is the progression of um, you with Joanna? What's the, where's this work going? So we will help her with whatever she wants to do, basically. She wants to align with Rose's agenda more than anything else, probably. So this is a fine time to ask because she's moving into new areas of exploration with Rose in the sense of new articles, new teachings, new books, new presentations of sorts around Rose, etc. We have always supported her desire to go in whatever direction she wants to go in. This is not as easy a job as you might think it is because she wants to do the egoless kind of work that those who channel are drawn to. Egoless meaning rose only. However, this is a very fine partnership we have here. There is always going to be something she needs from us to help her in her creation. So we are going to help her with her things. However, she's going to be helping with our things too. In this, there's reason to say it's going to be very human what she does. There's the reason for Rose right there to help you realize we're here with you and she will be the person who is sort of cluelessly weaning herself of her fears in order to be more Rose. When she is more Rose, she's going to be more human than ever, indeed. So this is something to view as a way to see 
how others might grow into the role too. Well, thank you very, very much. And thank you for uh, making me come here as well. <laughs> yes, you're very welcome. We love you dearly, you both. And we are happy to see you here again in this lifetime indeed. So do go forth, do good work, and we're here with you whenever you need us. Indeed, dear ones. Thank you. You're very welcome.